At the age of 14, Freddie Adu was already the poster boy of US soccer and the most famous US footballer of all time. When he signed for DC United, he became the youngest professional athlete in the United States in more than a century, and the weight of a nation rested on his 14-year-old shoulders. To many people, the name Freddie Adu is synonymous with underachievement and lost potential, one of world football's all-time great what-if stories. My first paid gig as a football writer, which involved writing fairly lengthy football or soccer-related lists, was for a publication based in North America. One of the first articles they ever asked me to write was a top 10 of underwhelming wonder kids from the history of the sport. Freddie Adu came top, as he almost always does, in lists of that ilk, and I swore to myself that I would never feature Adu in another article that I wrote. It just seemed too obvious, too tired, and too cliché. I stayed true to my word whilst writing for that website, and it's only very recently that I've started to include him on this channel, typically in factual videos when I've no other choice but to do so, such as in my recent video taking a look at world football's seven youngest debutants of all time. So when I first saw Joseph Fenney's comment on my video about MLS rebrands, I scrolled straight past it. I wasn't touching an entire video about Freddie Adu with a 20-foot pole, but then I thought about it for a moment because whilst the tale told about Freddie Adu has become tedious and cliche, my suspicion was that the real story was far from it. So for the last couple of weeks, I've been reading up on Freddie's past, re-watching old clips of him in his early years, and listening to accounts of his rise and subsequent fall from those who knew him best. And indeed, his story is much more interesting than the simplistic surface-level narrative parroted by listicles such as the ones that I used to write the world over. And then, just as I was getting started writing my script, I came across a recent podcast called American Prodigy by American sports journalist Grant Wall, all about Freddie Adu. Much of what they covered just added meat to the bones of the research that I'd already done, but it was still an invaluable resource, and it gave an extra flavour of Freddie's personality, since he did a couple of interviews with Wall on it. I nearly dropped the idea after listening to the podcast, since I figured that Freddie Adu's story might be a little saturated but I decided I'd given too much time to planning the video to drop it now. Besides, there are so many twists and turns to Freddy's story that a fair bit has happened even since that podcast came out just last year. If this video whets your appetite though, I would recommend giving the podcast a listen. It's interesting, well produced, and it's not too long. Without further ado though, and today is a rare occasion in which I cannot make the joke of saying without Freddy ado, since there is going to be a lot of Freddy ado in this video, Forget all of your preconceptions about Freddie Adu, cast aside the plethora of platitudes you've probably all heard about him, and join me on a journey as we take a more nuanced and detailed look at what really happened to Freddie Adu, the greatest player that never was. From as early as Adu can remember, he had a ball at his feet. Adu was born in the city of Tamer, Ghana, an old fishing village which became a major port, trading and industry hub following Ghana's independence in 1957. Tamer had some footballing pedigree as a city, having been the birthplace of Ghanaian international Nilamti, who had been hailed as the next Pele during his teenage years, but suffered a fate that would eerily foreshadow Adu's own future in the game. Every day, a young Freddy and his friends would turn the streets of Tamer into their playground, playing football until night fell. In 1997, Freddie's mother, Amelia, won a green card through the so-called Green Card Lottery as one of only 55,000 successful applicants out of a pool of millions from across the globe. Fewer than 1% of applicants are successful, but Amelia was one of them, and the family relocated to the city of Rockville, Maryland, around 15 miles north of Washington, D.C. The Adus were neither hard up nor well off in Ghana, but in the United States, they were poor. To make matters worse, soon after the move, Freddie's father left, never to return. Amelia worked two jobs to help the family get by, but even then it was a struggle. The move from Ghana to the United States wasn't just an economic shock for the family, but also a culture shock in terms of football for Freddie. In Ghana, football is the sport. Every kid played it on every street corner until they were called home by their parents. In the United States, in the late 1990s at least, that footballing culture just didn't exist. Soccer wasn't, and in many respects still isn't, the sport of the every man or every woman in the United States, better associated with suburban mums than metropolitan kids in deprived neighbourhoods. Football was all Freddie knew though, and it didn't take him long for his talents to be noticed at school. 
after a school friend invited Freddy to join his junior team at a tournament, Aru stood out a mouth. The team won the tournament for the very first time, with Adu scoring virtually every one of their goals. When he was just 10 years old, Freddy was invited on an under-14 tour from the United States to a tournament in Italy, where once again, his team won, Freddy was the top scorer, and everyone was asking, who's that kid? His talents hadn't gone unnoticed by scouts from some of Italy's top teams, and Inter Milan reportedly offered Freddy a contract worth $750,000 for a 10-year-old. It must have been hard for Amelia to turn the deal down whilst working two jobs back home in Washington, but she felt that Freddy was too young to move halfway around the world for a second time. A year later, Adu was invited to join the world-renowned IMG Academy in Florida, home to some of the world's finest facilities across a whole range of sports. Whilst the facilities and coaching may have been state-of-the-art, Freddy hated it. He was just 11 years old. Everyone else was at least 14. His interests were totally different to theirs, he felt isolated, alone, and he had no close friends. This would become a familiar tale for Freddy, often surrounded by people many years older than him. IMG is renowned for its high expectations of athletes, and it was the first time that some of the joy had been sucked out of the sport for a day. Nonetheless, his performances on the pitch kept on improving, and quietly, people were starting to ponder whether this could come become the real deal. Over the next couple of years, that would go from quiet whispers between coaches to bold declarations on the front of ESPN and Sports Illustrated. When Adu was still only 13, the cat was well and truly out of the bag that some had pretty lofty expectations for him. His balance, agility, quick feet, and thunderous left foot made for excellent highlight reels, especially as Adu jinked past people twice his size, and before long, he was receiving global attention. In 2003, Freddie signed his first major endorsement deal with Nike, who paid $1 million for a four-year partnership. Adu might already have been one of the highest paid soccer players in the United States before he had even played a professional game, but the 2003 Under-17 World Championship, now known as the FIFA Under-17 World Cup, would give the surest indication yet of his real talent. There was some serious talent at that tournament in Finland, from Kaelor Navas and João Moutinho to Cesc Fabregas and David Silva. In the United States' opening game, Freddie Adu scored a hat-trick, including the goal of the tournament as he picked the ball up in a deep position and slalomed around a number of South Korean defenders, then the goalkeeper, before slotting home. In the United States' next game against Sierra Leone, Adu scored again. The US were eventually knocked out by eventual winners Brazil, but Adu, the youngest player at the tournament, had justified the hype. Freddie describes this as the moment that he personally realised that he could be special. From this moment on, every team in the world wanted to sign him, and the sports pages in the US were rife with speculation as to whether Adu would sign for an MLS team or try his luck with one of Europe's elite. FIFA had recently implemented rules preventing European clubs from signing players before the age of 16, but rumours persisted that the continent's wealthiest clubs could circumvent those regulations. Had Adu joined a European team at that age, he undoubtedly would have gone into the team's academy for at least 18 months. 14-year-olds just don't play in Syria or the Premier League. It doesn't matter how good they are. In the MLS, though, Adu would be promised immediate first-team football and to be the star of the show. For a 14-year-old who just loved playing football, it was too good to turn down. And to sweeten the deal, the MLS even made special arrangements for Adu to join DC United, despite FC Dallas having the first draft pick, so that he could stay at his family home. The contract that he signed with the MLS to represent DC United was worth half a million dollars a year, which, by my reckoning, and the MLS published player salaries every season, made him the best paid player in the league. It has often been said that there was a fair amount of resentment towards Adu at this time from the league's more established players. Landon Donovan, who had already scored 20 international goals for the USMNT and had been named as the best young player at the 2002 World Cup, was earning $367,500 with the San Jose Earthquakes. Most players weren't even earning a tenth of a due salary. The MLS is still, but was even more explicitly at the time, a very young league. Players who felt as though they had built the league up and had families to support witnessed a 14-year-old waltz onto the scene being handed the biggest contracts in the league, the biggest endorsement deals, and having the paparazzi follow him everywhere he went. Of course, this wasn't Freddy's fault, but it left a sour taste in the mouth to some. 
A lot has been made of Adu's career earnings, and whether he received too much too young. But one thing that is for sure is the fact that he generated a lot more money for the MLS and for US soccer than he ever received in return, despite spending a number of seasons as the league's highest earner. Two million people tuned in across the United States to witness Adu's debut, in which he was introduced as a substitute in a game which saw two players sent off. The MLS has come a long way since 2004, but even today, that would be an enormous audience for the league. The league's average TV audience last season was just 226,000, with 1.07 million viewers tuning in for the 2020 MLS Cup Final. During his debut campaign, Adu increased the home attendances of teams that DC United played against by an estimated average of 11,000. No one had done that in American soccer since Pele. Speaking of Pele, Adu starred alongside the Brazilian legend in one of his many endorsement deals at the age of 14, a Sierra Mist commercial which saw the two players engage in a freestyle battle of which Adu emerged victorious, against arguably the greatest footballer of all time. Whoever labelled Adu as the next Pele clearly had little interest in his well-being or development, but that commercial can't have helped either. This was all part of the American hate machine at the time though. The MLS was only 8 years old in 2004. Most of the world considered the league to be something of a gimmick, created as part of the US's obligation to develop the sport at home following their successful bid to host the 1994 World Cup. Many people, within and outside of America, suspected that the league would eventually go the same way as the NASL, and with good reason. The league was losing money at an alarming rate. Attendances were dwindling, reaching a nadir in 2000, but still lower in 2003 than they had been in the season's inaugural 1996 campaign, and one man owned half the league's 10 teams, effectively propping up the division on his own. As the NBA and NFL boomed, the MLS was in dire need of a spark, and Freddie Adu seemed to emerge almost like a gift from God. Not only was he tearing it up at international level against top-class opposition his age and older, Freddie was personable, likeable, and confident. Even at the age of 14, he had bags of charisma. People took to him, and he was an advertiser's dream. US soccer, the media, and the MLS weren't about to let an opportunity like this go to waste. In Europe, when a young player starts to make waves that young, most people around them will do their best to temper expectations. A 16 or 17 year old, after all, is still a kid. They need to keep learning and keep enjoying their football. The last thing they need is to be burdened with the hopes and dreams of a nation or to be compared with three time World Cup winning legends of the game. No one in Germany or at Borussia Dortmund are comparing Yusufa Makoku to Pele despite his obvious talents, because it would be grossly unhelpful and irresponsible. And he's basically a veteran at 16 compared to Adu when he broke through. In many respects, the Freddy mania that surrounded Adu from the age of 14 was the perfect cocktail of building a child up to fail, and typified everything that was wrong with US soccer at the time, and perhaps still plagues the sport and players in the States now, though hopefully to a lesser degree. Throughout Adu's formative years, when he ought to have been honing his skills, developing his tactical understanding, and growing up as naturally as possible, marketing and hype took precedence over coaching and proper development. In spite of all this, Adu's debut campaign was actually remarkably impressive for a 14-year-old. Most rookies are happy just to hit double figures in terms of appearances in the MLS, aged 18 or 19, but at 14, Adu made 30 appearances, he scored 5 goals, and DC United won the MLS Cup. To most, it would have been a dream debut campaign, and unthinkable for one so young, but Freddie wasn't content. Most of his appearances had come off the bench, as DC looked to ease him into first-team football, but he wanted to start games. That might seem absurd coming from a 14-year-old, but it's important to remember that Freddie could not ignore the hype that surrounded him. When you're being told that you're the next Pele and the greatest gift US soccer has ever had, it's not that strange that you could begin to think that you should be starting every game. The American Prodigy podcast floats the suggestion that Adu might have had one or two outside influences within his own family, who planted the idea in his head that he ought to be playing more often. Tensions grew during Adu's second season, as DC missed out on the title, and though he finally got his wish in the 2006 season, age 16, playing in every game as a regular starter, Adu still wasn't content. He saw himself as a central player, primarily as a number 10, and Real Salt Lake offered him the opportunity to reunite with his former US Under-17 boss, John Ellinger, who had got the best out of him a few years earlier. 
For the first time, Adu wouldn't be the star attraction in the MLS in 2007, following David Beckham's arrival at LA Galaxy. He would still become the highest earner at Real Salt Lake though, and he remained one of the best paid players in the entire league. Unfortunately, Ellinger was sacked a month after Adu arrived at Salt Lake, which would become a common theme throughout Freddie's career. He would get a great feel from a manager, sign for them, and then they'd lose their job. Ever since Adu graduated to the professional ranks in 2004, he had struggled with accusations of laziness and inability to track back, and of playing as an individual rather than for the team. To which, the obvious response would have been, well yes, he's 14. By 2007 though, Freddie was 17, and people were starting to beg the question of when he would be able to iron out the deficiencies in his game. Of course, the reality is that Adu was never really given the chance to naturally work on his game and develop within youth team football without an enormous spotlight put upon him and people expecting him to be able to grow and develop naturally with millions of eyeballs on him in a dressing room full of people twice his age with whom he had virtually nothing in common. At Real Salt Lake though, accusations of Adu's flaws extended beyond his footballing talents and more towards his character. Freddie had made an awful lot of money at a very young age without actually achieving a great deal in the senior game. From 14, he had the world at his fingertips. He could buy whatever he wanted, and he had people waiting on him hour and day. It would be unsurprising if accusations that, at the age of 17, some of this had gone to his head were to be true. His performances for Real Salt Lake were poor and showed regression on where he had been three years earlier. However, Edu turned on the style when it mattered most. Four years on from the Under-17 World Championships in Finland, Adu would be the United States' star man at the 2007 Under-20 World Cup in Canada. Yet again, there was some serious talent on show at that tournament. Gerard Piquet, Alexis Sanchez, Luis Suarez, Edinson Cavani, Alexander Pato, Sergio Aguero, the list goes on and on. The United States topped their group, beating Brazil and Poland, and drawing with South Korea. In the second group game against Poland, Adu scored a hat-trick, including possibly the finest solo goal of his career. In the round of 16, the US beat a Uruguay team containing Luis Suarez and Edinson Cavani, and though they were later beaten by Austria, Adu's international reputation was sky-high once again. In 2006, Freddie had gone on trial at Manchester United. Alex Ferguson first became aware of Adu, like a lot of people, in 2004 and in 2006, he invited him to get a feel of Old Trafford and to train with the first team. It's often said that Fergie was the first man to see that Adu was all hype, no talent, but that isn't actually true. Ferguson thought that Adu had talent, but Manchester United wanted to wait until he was 18 to make a decision on whether or not they wanted to sign him. Of course, ultimately, they didn't, but following his heroics in Canada, Adu wasn't short of European offers again in 2007. In the end, he made what seemed like a very smart decision to join Benfica. Not only are the Portuguese giants a footballing institution and a massive club, they also have a tremendous track record when it comes to developing young players. Adu set Benfica back 2 million US dollars and he would link up with Angel Di Maria in Lisbon, who was a similar age to Adu, and had also featured the 2007 finals in Canada. Adu would go on to compare his career with Di Maria's for some time, and it was a comparison which didn't bode too well for him. In his debut campaign, Adu played 14 games, and he felt as though he had the edge over Di Maria in terms of his development. Yet again though, supposedly influenced by outside voices, Adu kicked up a fuss about his lack of minutes, and accepted a deal to go on loan to Monaco. The following season, Di Maria flourished, later going on to sign for Real Madrid, Manchester United, and PSG, and he remains one of the finest wide players on the planet right now. Adu describes his loan move to Monaco as the biggest mistake of his career, and has pondered how his and Di Maria's fates might have differed had he never made it. Personally, I think that could be wishful thinking, but football is a game of fine margins, and Adu rarely got the rub of the green. His stint at Monaco kickstarted a flurry of loan moves in Greece, Portugal, and Turkey. The last of the three was both the lowliest reflection of Adu, playing in Turkey's second tier, but also his most impressive, as he knuckled down, concentrated on his football, and put in some decent performances. By this stage, few felt that Adu would become the next Pele, or US soccer's first genuine superstar, but he was still only 21, so there were hopes that he could still become a very good player and one of the US MNT star men. 
He was recalled to the senior national team in 2011 for the Gold Cup, where he didn't play a single minute until the semi-finals, when he came on as a substitute and set up the US MNT's winner against Panama. He was then a surprise starter in the final against Mexico, where he played as Bob Bradley's talisman in front of over 93,000 fans at the Rose Bowl in California. Playing in his preferred central role, as a lone striker this time, Adu impressed. The United States lost 4-2, but following much pessimism, Freddie Adu's name was back on people's lips. It was typical of the early years of his career, as his club form routinely underwhelmed before a handful of stunning international appearances breathed new life into the myth of Freddie May. Remarkably, this would be Adu's last ever game for the US MNT, aged only 21. Bob Bradley, who had placed his trust in Adu, was sacked shortly after, and his replacement young Klinsman never recalled him. After his Gold Cup performances, Adu returned to the MLS with Philadelphia Union. Though Adu was no longer the league's star attraction, with the likes of Beckham, Henri, and Robbie Keane on show now, he once again became his team's highest earner, and one of the best paid players in the entire league with a guaranteed salary of more than $500,000. Yet again, Adu was signed by a former manager in Peter Novak, his old DC United boss, and yet again, the manager who had signed him would be sacked shortly after Adu arrived. Adu's only full season with the union in 2012 would actually statistically be the best of his career, as he played 28 games and scored 8 goals but for a man who had been built up to such unrealistic expectations as a boy, the reality in adulthood always seemed underwhelming. It's possible that if Adu had stuck around in the MLS following that decent season in Philadelphia, he would have had a more stable career, and perhaps he would still be playing in the league now. Instead, he joined Bahia in Brazil, where he played four games before leaving the club, accusing them of not having met their contractual obligations to pay him. Adu took Bayer to court in 2014, over $220,000 in unpaid wages. Adu's departure from Brazil probably ended any genuine expectations of a return to international duty, or even to top flight football in any established league. Adu was still only 23, an age at which many players are just starting to find their feet, yet he was already considered to be washed up and finished. Stints in Serbia and Finland followed, yielding very little, before Adu returned to the US, but not to the MLS, spending two seasons with Tampa Bay Rowdies in the NASL. After being released by Tampa, Adu went almost two years without a club. He returned with the Las Vegas Lights in the United Soccer League, where he made 14 appearances before being released once again. That began a more than two-year hiatus from the sport, which has seen Adu take his first steps into coaching, where he seemed to really rediscover his love of the game. At the start of this year, Adu made a much-anticipated comeback, in Sweden's lowly third tier, with a young club called Erstelund with a wealthy but somewhat shady owner. It seemed like last chance stuff, and Adu said as much himself, but after just one month without having registered a single first-team appearance, Freddy was released, with the club's management stating, From what we have seen, we have a hard time seeing that he will be able to compete. He has a lot of football in him, but the physical and the mental are missing. He was clearly disappointed. He's a really nice guy in every way, and I'm convinced he would have been a great football player, but he lacks the physicality required. We were actually a little surprised at how unprepared he was when he came here. End quote. It was an all too familiar tale for the 31 year old, even if we hadn't heard it for a while. Adu has since boasted of now being fully fit on social media, possibly positioning himself for one very last attempt to make a return to the sport he clearly adores but it's difficult to see who will take a chance on him now. If Adu wasn't up to the standard of the Swedish third tier, there can be few teams above a semi-professional standard who would touch him. Any allure that his reputation as a 14-year-old carried has now been a road. I think it's important to address a couple of things. The first is Adu's age, which has been a constant source of conspiracy and confusion. The suggestion of falsified African birth certificates is one that plays upon both xenophobic stereotypes and genuine historical precedent, depending upon the context of who and how doubts surrounding Adu's age are voiced. Way back in the early 2000s, Sports Illustrated sent an investigative team to Ghana to investigate Adu's age dispute. They found his birth certificate, which did state his age as being 14, though obviously that isn't conclusive evidence. No one has ever produced any substantive evidence to suggest that Adu wasn't the age he claimed, other than the fact that he either looked or seemed older than he said he was. 
It's a curious juxtaposition that Adu does come across as being very mature for someone of 14 in interviews and press commitments from 2004, yet his teammates, coaches, and acquaintances from that time often describe him as being extremely immature and seem to express very little doubt about his stated age. Ultimately, I've no way of knowing, and nor does virtually anyone else, though it would obviously explain quite a bit if Adu was older than people believed at 14. It would explain why he looked so comfortable competing with players two or three years older than him, why he stood out to Mal alongside his peers from day one, and why he didn't develop, as hoped, into his late teens and early 20s. It would even explain why he was seemingly finished by his mid to late 20s. However, even if Adu is older than 31 now and was older than 14 in 2004, I think it is doubtful that he was considerably older. Even if Adu was, say, 16, not 14, he was still a tremendous talent who was competing on the same stage as players like Cesc Fabregas and Sergio Aguero and still being the star of the show. It may be less impressive if he were the same age as them, rather than having been a couple of years younger, but it would still mean that he was one hell of a prospect. Therefore, I do have a sense of sadness that Adu wasn't just allowed to develop his tactical and physical attributes in the way even a European wonder kid would have been able to. There were times in the Freddy Adu podcast where you sensed some self-pity from Adu, a few hard luck tales about managers departing or wrong decisions. Reflecting on his career, no doubt he often didn't get the rub of the green, but that's football. The difference with Freddy Adu is that he never developed that mental toughness that bulldog attitude of fighting every day in training and someone else always tussling with you for your shirt. I think that would be a perfectly legitimate criticism of a do, but I also think it is absolutely to be expected of a boy who within years of moving to the United States as an eight-year-old was being told that he was a superstar, he was doing meet and greets with Pele, and being given the idea that the world was at his feet, before he had even kicked a ball in anger. Reflecting on the story of Freddie Adu in its entirety, it's clear that he was always a pawn in someone else's game, and that those outside interests had very little care for what was actually best for him. However, that's not to say that Freddie Adu was a pitiful victim. He has had an extraordinary life, even if he didn't manage to win an extraordinary number of caps or become an extraordinarily talented senior footballer. Adu made a lot of money out of football. How much of that he still has, who knows? But his mother, who arrived in Rockville, Maryland, from Ghana's coast in 1997 and had to work two jobs to support her family after Freddie's dad left, still hasn't had to work a single day in her life since Freddie signed his $1 million endorsement deal with Nike as a 13-year-old. How many people, never mind children, can do that? Adu also raised the profile of the MLS as much as almost anyone else, particularly among the black community. African Americans who grew up in the mid-2000s, who may never have had any interest in soccer without a do, suddenly saw representation and had legitimate reason to believe that they could make it in the sport. Like so many stories, the story of Freddie Adu is not as simple as it first appears. You cannot call Freddie Adu a bona fide success because he failed to live up to almost any of the absurd expectations laid out in front of him as a child but you certainly cannot call Freddie Adu a failure when he lived the American dream, turned his family's life around, and changed the face of US soccer forever. That is it for today's video. I would again like to recommend listening to the American Prodigy podcast if this video has left you with a thirst for even more Adu information, and added input from Freddie himself. But thank you all as ever for watching. Please do give this video a like if you enjoyed it, it really helps with the YouTube algorithms. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications for HITC7s. You can also find me on Twitter or Instagram, or indeed both, by the username at HITC7s on both platforms, should you wish to do so.